definitely was a lot. I think, like, if you're not a, if you're not a musician, you know, you get too much out of it, because a lot, I mean, Facebook is great for it. Okay. But, it's not cool. Yeah, no. Except it gets jealous. I had, like, two kids that really play. Oh, yeah. Get off the No, but it's fun to watch how differently all of them approach what they do. Like, it's just, it's, like, I have to go back and see them and how they put their stuff together, you know? It's kind of fun, because then they, they give you ideas for future They do, yeah, 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 no, it's, it's awesome. Well, Jimmy Page has been using ideas for, like, all of
everyone. Welcome to Christ Our Anchor Presbyterian Church. So glad to see each one of you here sitting with us this morning. Glad to know that those of you who are at home watching are there with us also. Welcome to you. A special welcome if you've not been with us for a while or if you're brand new. We have a ton of things going on in church life that I'd love to tell you about. One is that you all may know this, but pastors often get people coming to them, especially in the months like winter, asking for financial help with things like utility bills that they can't pay. And that is especially high right now. We're still sort of coming out of COVID. So we've gotten a lot of requests and we've actually finally depleted our benevolence account down to a small amount. So if anyone feels so moved to give to that, we pull from that account to give to families in need in Anne Arundel County. So if, if you want to give to that account at any time, there is a line item on our website if you give online, and you can also just put it at the bottom of your check. Um, and we don't just want to give money to individuals. We also want to support the organizations that help people in need. So with that in mind, next Sunday, the 22nd, right after the worship service, Lighthouse Shelter and Homelessness Prevention Center in Annapolis right here, they are sending three representatives to our worship service, and they will be hosting a Q&A after the service. So if there's anything that you want to ask about how they do their work, and they have a new executive director, what their mission is in this time post-COVID, how we can best be helpful, they will be right here with us, not online, but like here in person. Imagine that after the service next Sunday. And we are going to be doing a special clothing drive for them also starting next Sunday and through February. So you'll be hearing more about that in hopes and notes. Keep an eye out for that. This coming week, we are opening registration for Anchors of Weed Preschool. If you know anyone with kids ages two to five, Church members get to register a day early, which is pretty fun, but it's this Thursday and Friday. It's such a wonderful school, great reputation in the neighborhood. Tons of people, raise your hands if you've sent a kid or grandkid to Anchors a Wee. There's a few of us, so you can ask us any questions you'd like about that. We even have some church members who are teachers there, so it really is a great place. A couple other things, we are hiring at Christ Our Anchor. We need your help, you guys watching and you guys who are here. Spread the word in your circles. We post regularly on Facebook with the link to the jobs that we are hiring for, Christian educator and church administrator, so the church office. And the best way that we're going to get quality applicants, I think, is by friends of friends, people who know folks who might have the good skills and want to work in a flexible, warm environment like COA. So spread the word about that. 
And the last thing is, you all probably are aware because you're off tomorrow, that it is the weekend honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so that inspired me, that and the new year inspired me that each week you're going to be hearing one of the scripture readings from either an ecumenical partner of mine, a clergy partner that's local, or one of our young adults that we don't get to see very often, just to remind us that the church is connected. We are all connected around the world, just like Dr. King said, an inescapable network of mutuality. That's what the church is. So I hope that that will be meaningful for you to see people participate in the service who you may not know or may not have seen. Let us continue our worship with the opening song. I'd invite you to stand as you are able. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my dead to pay, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to us to show Holy God, your faithful love toward us never ends. It is as sure and dependable as the sky over our heads. We praise you. We've gathered in this place to offer you our worship and our thanksgiving, to declare to any who, who will listen that you are our God and we are your people. Holy One, you have promised to be with us and long ago sent your spirit to abide among us and guide us to a future of goodness and hope. We come hope seeking your truth, your justice, your kindness. Oh, you are with us this morning. Let us feel your presence and welcome you into our lives. Come and fill the desires of ours. May your spirit be at work among us as we worship opening our eyes to the light of your presence in this place. To you alone, faithful creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be all glory and honor now and forever. Amen. The first scripture reading this morning is from the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 7, excuse me, 3 to 7. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, 
to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to whom, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings, you will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to call forward any children who want to come and sit with me down front. And if you're at home watching, call them up to the TV. Let me know you're there because I'd love to know which kiddos were with us today. Say hi to us and we'll say hi back to you later this week. Hi, friends. Hi, friends. Great to see you. Wyatt and Libby and Katie and Penny. Hi, Beckett. So, you guys, I wanted to ask, this might be too old for you. I don't know. But have you ever seen a Where's Waldo picture? Do you know who I'm talking about? Actually, you do. So, you guys have seen it. You know, I did not do this on purpose. But my daughter, Penny, is dressed a little like Where's Waldo. He... <laughs> He is, I did not, I swear, I did not do this on purpose, but he wears a red and white striped shirt and hat and socks. So you would think it'd be really easy to find him, right? That's a pretty easy picture to find in the book, right? You know, I haven't read a book with him with a whole story. I'll have to look. You've got three of them. That is very cool. Well, you know, so always with Where's Waldo, is it easy or is it hard to find him? You think it's easy? I think it's so hard. Grown-ups, do you think it's easy or hard to find Waldo, especially the older we get? It's very hard, isn't it? Well, I brought a picture to show the grown-ups and to show you. You guys can look at this one, but I want to show the grown-ups. Can you find Waldo in this picture? Do you already know? Where, where is he? Wow, you really are good. Where is he? Oh, there's the wizard. Oh, interesting. Where's Waldo? With? Wow, he was fast. He really did find him just that fast. Did you guys see him? It's hard to find him, isn't he? He's right down here. See how he looks like you, Penny, in his shirt? Well, and I wanted to ask you about where's Waldo because sometimes, sometimes people in church, grown-ups and kids, we have a hard time knowing where to look to find Jesus. We come here to church, and we want to feel God's presence. We want to be able to see Jesus present among us, but it's hard to find him. Where would you look if you were going to find Jesus? Where would you look? In church or... Where would you look? Do you have any idea? What do you think, grown-ups? Where would you look if you were trying to find Jesus in church? Where do you find him? I don't know. Right? You know where he is? Oh, is he in? Maybe Jesus is in that picture, too. We'd have to look a little harder. When we're, in, you know, when we're in church, I think a lot of people come, and they expect maybe they'll find Jesus in the music because the music lifts up their spirits. Maybe they think they'll find him in the Bible readings that we do because we call that God's word to us. So we might say, oh, that's God speaking to us. And do you know where else we might find Jesus? Do you know? In each other. We don't just stay at home all the time and have church all by ourselves. We come and we get together because we might be able to see God present with us better in our friends who are here, maybe in an old friend or a new friend. We might feel really loved and cared for and say, oh, God's with me after all. That's what Epiphany is all about, is finding ways to see something we think we know in a new way, seeing in new ways. I see you looking hard, Wyatt. So, I mean, you know what? I'm going to give you this picture, and you can take it, and you can find them all through the service, because I bet you'll surprise Mommy with all the things you can find. Do you know, I think... I think that sometimes our 
kid friends can show us how to point to Jesus for each other better than we can. We watch you guys a lot because you're very good at making new friends and being kind. So we're watching you guys. You encourage us. We're glad you're here. Can you show me your praying hands? Let's say a prayer together that we all can find Jesus, even when he's hard to find. Let's say a prayer. Repeat after me, friends. God, we thank you that you are everywhere waiting for us to find you, waiting to connect with us. Thank you for loving us and bless everyone here this morning. Amen. Thanks, friends. You guys might not have heard them. They prayed for all of you. Wasn't that sweet? You don't want to keep it and find other stuff? Show it to mommy. I bet she'll be like me and say, that's hard. <laughs> Wait till your eyesight starts going when you get older. You'll know the reason. Waldo gets smaller and smaller and smaller.
Good morning and praise the Lord. I am Stephen Tillett, pastor of Asbury Broadneck United Methodist Church and one of the co-chairs of ACT, Anne Arundel Connecting Together. I thank Pastor Jesse for inviting me to join you this morning in the reading of today's epistle lesson, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 2 through 9. And herein we find these words. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. May the Lord add a rich blessing and understanding to the reading, hearing, and living of his holy word. Amen. start this sermon with quiet prayer, just for a moment, something so many of my colleagues do and which I feel a renewed nudge about doing every week with you all. And this is important because we have a prayer time later in the service with our joys and concerns, but that's mostly us telling God things about our lives. So all of us through my voice talking to God. But prayer is also a lot about listening to God. So in preparation, I hope for God speaking through the sermon, let's take a beat. Just a pause to quiet our hearts and minds and listen to God. Amen. This prayer moment is a great segue because I want to ask all of you, when you do bow your heads or close your eyes or make your praying hands like our kids do, what are you looking for? You don't have to answer out loud, but what are you looking for? When you come to church or when you crack open your Bible to read, what are you looking for in that moment? Now, of course, you all might say you're looking for God. You're hoping to feel God's presence or be enlightened in some new way. Perfect for Epiphany, right? This is Epiphany season in the church. We have seasons in the church just like we do in the natural world, and they're very intentional. But we have Epiphany between Christmas and Lent. And Epiphany literally means appearance, manifestation, something coming to be with you. It's embodied most famously in the story of the Magi visiting Jesus, but there are actually many, many epiphanies of God and many ways that God shows up in our world. So if you're looking for God, what exactly are you looking for? What are you expecting? We all have different experiences of God, and for better or worse, most of our impressions of what God is like are mediated through other people, right? through being raised in a particular church or lack thereof, mediated by people with particular beliefs or lack thereof. They're mediated by impressions of people who say that they believe in God. We get impressions about who God is based on the people who say they believe in him, right? That's how we learn about God. So all of that is subject to change throughout life. But this Epiphany Sermon series I want us to dwell very intentionally on God's promises to us, which do not change, the part that remains the same. So even through monumental changes in the world and in God's people, even through the most earth-shattering revelation of God that there ever was, the incarnation, God's promises remain the same. And this week we focus on God's promise of faithfulness. Notice I said God's faithfulness, not our faithfulness. When we hear about being faithful, we do tend to think of ourselves expressing faith, how much faith we have. And what kinds of things, this is one that I do want you all to try to answer, what kinds of things do we associate with someone when we say that they are faithful? What do we mean by that? What do you think of when I say someone is faithful? Loyal? 
trustworthy? You guys can answer online too. I'll check later. What else? Loyal and trustworthy? Jane? You can count on them. Yes, there's a steadiness, right? Anything else? True to their word. Absolutely. So all of those things, we probably think how humans show up that way. What does it mean if God promises to be faithful to us? The Bible tells us God will love us. We established that last Wednesday with the baptism, how God promises us a new life that is grounded in belovedness. With God being faithful, it means that love will not be moved whether or not we are ever good at loving God back, ever. Whether or not we want anything to do with God, no matter what, that love remains. God is on our side. There's nothing we can do about that. God will not forget us. God will not withhold forgiveness. God will be with us in triumph and in suffering. And God even knows that sometimes it's the good times, the good times, not the hard times, where we're more apt to turn away and say, I've got this. I don't need this. I don't need God. I don't need the community. God knows that. All of this is to say God is faithful to us even when we are not faithful, when we are not loyal and trustworthy and able to be counted on and true to our word. We're an extremely reciprocal and transactional culture. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. He got what was coming to him. She deserves more. We say things like that, right? We are very reciprocal, and we build our relationship dynamics based on those kinds of ideas, that if people are loving to us, okay, we'll love them. If they are rude or standoffish to us, we tend to give at least a little bit of that back to them, because that's just fair, right? That's just fair. But God is not like that. God does not love us only if we love God back. I read a great book years ago that was actually recommended to me by my sister, who she would tell any one of you she wrestles a lot with her faith. And it's called If Grace is True, and the subtitle is Why God Will Save Every Person. If Grace is True, Why God Will Save Every Person. And the author writes, God looks for the slightest yielding, the smallest opening to make his love known. God has said in Isaiah 65, 1, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here I am. Here I am. So God's faithfulness goes above and beyond what we would do. It actually seeks us out to love us. It actually looks for opportunities to love us. But where do those show up? Do we see God doing that? Where are we expecting that kind of faithfulness? And let's see what our scriptures have to say to us about this. In 1 Corinthians, we hear from Paul, who, as many of you know, had a dramatic conversion story that's probably unlike many of yours. Many of you were gradually exposed to faith over many years, right? But he, Paul, was literally knocked off of his horse with the epiphany hmm, of who Jesus really was. And he went on from there to successfully plant churches all over the ancient world. And one of the most prominent of those churches was the one in the city of Corinth that he wrote a letter to today. Paul had spent about a year and a half with the Corinthian church, much like a modern interim pastor. A year and a half, and then he had to keep moving on to plant new churches. But this church was very dear to his heart, so he kept in touch with them. He wrote them some of his longest letters. And unfortunately... Word on the street about this Corinthian church that he loved so much was that they were a complete mess. They were coming apart at the seams with divisions and infighting and abuse of power. And this book, Paul's longest epistle, it's mostly addressing their mess. Now, just a little aside here. I heard some of you laugh, so you probably know what I'm going to say. Those of you who look around at churches today who are declining and embroiled in scandal, and you just think there was this golden age way back when when churches were so great, well, 1 Corinthians tells us that doesn't exist. There was never such a thing. We all have our good times and bad, but 1 Corinthians shows us that as long as human beings are what make up places like these, they will screw up and they will disagree. So... Paul, before he dives into the mess of how they're all disagreeing, before he gets into advice and rebuke and correction, he starts with those words that you heard Pastor Tillette read today. Words of sincere gratitude 
words of genuine love and affection for these people. He reminds them that they are not lacking in any gift. It can be easy to forget that, right? Certainly churches these days and their pastors, we keep slipping back into an anxious scarcity mentality, focused on who all is not here, who's not ever coming back, who doesn't like what we're all doing, who's not giving, who's, what things are not working. It's easy to focus on that stuff, but I think Paul would tell us what he told Corinth. We already have everything we need right here. We have all the gifts, even the things that may seem like hurdles and challenges could actually be gifts for us. So for example, Corinth's church struggled mightily with their unbelievable diversity. They have diversity churches today would pay for. It made it hard for them to make decisions and hard for them to agree. But wouldn't you all agree that diversity in the church is a gift? We all wish for that. It's hard to find. It might be hard to live with genuine diversity, but it's what God wants for his faith families to look like, reflective of every human person and every human experience. And through all the ways that we try to piece together this messy faith family that we're building, God is still with us. God never left. The Corinthian church has strayed far from grace, but grace has never strayed from them. That's what Paul wants them to know. Grace has always been with them. And Paul actually uses the word, did you hear this? Did you see enriched? I thought that was an interesting word, a weird word. When we see that word enriched on food, do you see it on breads and cereals? Do you know what that means? It means that you add back in the vitamins and nutrients that were lost during the processing of the food. So if we're enriched, if we're thinking of that for ourselves, then we know God sees us go through the ringer in life, right? A lot to process in life, right? We're always processing a lot, but that God is actually putting all the good stuff back into us that might be lost in the process. Now, I did not say that God makes us just like we were before, back to the good old days. That's not what God does. God does give back the spiritual gifts that made the good times possible. They may look different now, but the gifts of the Spirit like faith, hope, and love, they're still here with us. They are right here. Look around you. Look around you. Look up at the people who are online. Imagine who's watching. We are enriched because of God's faithfulness to us. Eugene Peterson wrote in the message translation of 1 Corinthians 1, 9, that last verse of the passage, he wrote it like this. God who got you started in this spiritual adventure shares with us the life of his son and our master, Jesus. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. That's what Jesus is trying to say to us. That's what Paul is trying to say. So what would it look like then, knowing that? What would it look like, I wonder, if when some thorny issue came up in church life or life in general, if some thorny issue came up and before complaining or arguing, we asked the question, where is God present in this? How is God showing up here? What's the invitation from God here? that maybe I can't see yet. There's a humility to asking that because we assume there's things we don't know, that our feelings are not the be-all, end-all. There's something that God's trying to show us in these issues that are hard for us. One of the ways that we can help each other to see God's presence, to answer that question, is summed up in a little song that I sing every single month, every single year with our preschoolers in chapel. Do you guys know what that song is? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? And we have the hand motions and everything, and they love it. And I love seeing them sing it because they really get it. And they do shine. But see, we all have lights, but we're reluctant lights, aren't we? We don't feel very shiny, right? A little bit needing of a shine. And yet, God showed us with Jesus that other human beings pointing to God's love and care that's the best way for us to get to know God. It's the best way for us to get closer to God. We need each other for that relationship. And if you look back on Isaiah, you can see that he was a reluctant light too. God tells him so faithfully, I will be glorified in you. You're going to shine. That's what he's saying. You're going to shine. But Isaiah says basically, I don't know. It feels like nothing is happening. 
Did you see what he said? Feels like I've been working in vain. Nothing is happening. I'm not sure that I'm the one that you meant to choose for this. And this is hilarious. I never noticed this before. In response to Isaiah's insecurity and discouragement, God says, oh, so I actually have an even bigger job for you then. <laughs> now you're not just going to be my servant to Israel, but to all nations. Isn't that just like God? Right? We feel like a dust heap on the floor, and God says, nope, you're a beacon. Here's a bigger job. I mean, just imagine in life if you went to your boss and you said, I'm not sure I'm right for this, and then in response, you got a promotion. Isn't that just like God? See, there really is nothing that we can do about it. Everybody. God has chosen to love us and believe in us. God has placed a light in us, and we try to hide it under a bushel, but God is determined to make it shine some way, somehow. And it's so, so appropriate that we hear all of this on the weekend honoring Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because much like Isaiah, he was underestimated and despised by plenty of people. He's a hero now, but back then, he, in only 10 years, he went to jail 30 plus times. And not just he, but his family received countless death threats. It's easy to forget that. And however much we remember him as a giant of justice, he too had these dark moments of discouragement and insecurity where he questioned, what in the world do I think I'm doing? One of my favorite stories about him, because it shows his humanity, it's in the late January of 1956. So around this time in 1956, and Dr. King received a menacing phone call very common back then, a phone call at home from a stranger saying he would be sorry he ever traveled to Montgomery, Alabama. They would make him sorry. And he'd already received hundreds of these kinds of threats, but for some reason, we know how this goes, right? We don't always know why. For some reason, this one thing put him over the edge, and he broke a little bit. He could not sleep, and in his autobiography, he wrote, it seemed that all my fears had come down on me at once. I had reached the saturation point. And imagine if he had just given up then. He got up and began to pace through his house. He ended up in his kitchen, warming up some coffee, and he realized that he needed to pray. He needed to pray, and then he prayed these words. Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. I think I'm right. I'm here taking a stand for what I believe is right. But Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now. I'm faltering. I'm losing my courage. Now I am afraid. And I can't let the people see me like this because if they see me weak and losing my courage, they will begin to get weak. The people are looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. That's what he prayed. Have any of you ever prayed a prayer like that? Probably many times, right? And King said he felt what he could only describe as a quiet assurance, an inner voice. He had to make time for that other kind of prayer, listening to God. He heard an inner voice, and that voice of God told him to keep going. Why? Because God was with him. He wasn't doing it alone. And we know everything that unfolded. We know, did this mean that everything went smoothly and uneventfully for him from there on out? Very sadly, no. Three days later, his house was bombed. Twelve years later, he was killed. God's faithfulness is not a guarantee that the worst of the world won't touch us. It's not. God's faithfulness is a promise that absolutely no matter what we have a promise that God's strength will enable our strength. God's love will enable our love. And God's life in Jesus has enabled our life together. Thanks be to God.
Two five two eight eight and zero seven eight. Just want to mention that. Nothing can wash away my sin. Nothing can wash away my sin. Nothing can wash away my sin. Nothing, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can bring me peace with God. Nothing can bring me peace with God. Nothing can bring me peace with God. Nothing, nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can lead me to your throne. Nothing can lead me to your throne. Nothing can lead me to your throne. Nothing, nothing, nothing but the love of Jesus. Nothing can make your people one. Nothing can make your people one. Nothing can make your people one. Nothing, 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 nothing but the love of Jesus. Absolutely nothing, 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 nothing but the love of Jesus. Amen. Thank you to our band for leading us today and adding such beautiful music to our service. We come now to our time of sharing our joys and concerns and listening to each other and to God, what God would do with those. Um, I do want to share one celebration. Um, I wasn't sure if he was going to do it, but I was asked by our faithful live streamer in the back, Carolyn Brown, to celebrate with all of you that she and Mike celebrate 12 years of marriage today. Happy anniversary. And two beautiful kids. Thank you guys for being here. Others. Yes, Jane. Thank you for lifting all that up, Jane. For the benefit of those who couldn't hear or those online, um, we're praying for Jane's friend, Donna, who is seeing a surgeon about issues with her pancreas, and another friend, Roy, whose um, medicine has to be lowered because of it's trying to treat his cancer, but there's tons of side effects. Many of us have seen that, and Jane commented that there are so many of us who have been touched by cancer, so we pray for all of those people. And on a larger world level, we pray that the efforts towards justice and equality would not just be this weekend, but would be all year long for Dr. King. Thank you. Others? Yes, John. Absolutely. We're still praying for your family, Mary Gail. We know that um, the loss of your brother, Frank, is big for your family, and we've been praying for him for some time. So now we're praying for you all, too. Mm-hmm. Others? Anna? 
is I would like to just ask for um, prayers for safe travels. Jolene and Jay are traveling this weekend to New York, and I just like to make sure that they come back safely. So and have a good time, of course. And I don't have to repeat because you've got a mic. <laughs> 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 Yes, absolutely. We missed them this weekend, but hope they get back safely. Thank yes, you for sharing. You. Are we missing anybody? All right. Well, let's take another quiet moment and consider what each one of us wants to offer back to God. God, we do thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that even when it doesn't cross our mind to reach out to you, that you are always finding ways to reach out to us. And we pray for the people today that are most in need of your presence. It may be us, it may be family or friends or neighbors, it may be people we don't even like, but who need your presence, God, and we give them to you right now. We pray for those families who are dealing with grief, for Mary Gale's family and the ongoing feelings after the loss of her brother Frank. We pray for the neighbors and friends of Judy's in her condo community dealing with end-of-life issues, especially one of the younger residents, Ron, and his wife, Rose. We pray for the Ray family as they are bringing um, Dave's father, Charlie, home on hospice care tomorrow. And God, we pray for those who are dealing with pain and illness of any kind, of body, mind, or spirit. We pray for Jane's friend, Donna that this would be a fruitful meeting with the surgeon about her pancreas, for her friend Roy, that this decrease in dosage would help with side effects, but also still lead to healing if possible. For all those dealing with cancer, Lord, we lift them up to you. We continue prayers for Lisa Motel with her broken ankle. We pray for Mike Henderson's friend Andy with several operations coming up for his cancer treatment. We pray for the eye surgery coming up this Wednesday for Wendy Jacklitch's daughter, Kim, the day before Kim's birthday. We pray for Barb Perry, who has a biopsy coming up for possible new metastasis of her cancer. We pray for Cindy Root's best friend continuing to struggle with mental health issues. We continue prayers for Tom Rorick's sister and her husband as he has just been given a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. We pray for Debbie Swigert preparing for wrist surgery also this Wednesday and for another surgery a month later. We pray continued prayers of healing for Rob and we're so grateful that he's with us this morning in the band, Lord. We pray safe travels for Jolene and Jay, for anyone who is traveling in this season, Lord, protect them. And God, we do pray for our world. We pray that you would help all of us to hear your call to justice, whether through your word or through the words of prophets like Dr. King, Lord. We pray that it would not just be this weekend, but that you would help us find ways to make our life filled with greater equity and justice. We thank you for people to celebrate like Mike and Carolyn's anniversary, for birthdays, for children. We give all of this to you in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prayerfully consider what gifts we have to give back to God today of our finances, our time, our energy, or our care, let us pray. O oh God, we recognize that we have been blessed with great abundance. In offering these gifts, may we be strengthened to proclaim your faithfulness and your salvation this day and always. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Will the ushers please come forward?
trading my sorrows and I'm trading my shame and I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord and I'm trading my sickness and I'm trading my pain and I'm laying it down for the joy of the Persecuted, not abandoned, shut down, but not destroyed. But I'm blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure. His joy is gonna be my strength. Oh, the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes with the morning. I'm treating my sorrow. and blessing for you, my benediction, comes from something you may not even know exists, that the Presbyterian Church echoed the prayer that Jane said this morning. During the time of Dr. King, they drafted an entire new confession called the Confession of 1967, and it was meant to say our beliefs in these troubled times have to be open to change, even though God does not change. So it says, with an urgency born of our hope in Jesus Christ, let us apply ourselves to present tasks and strive for a better world. Let us not identify limited progress with the kingdom of God, nor let us despair in the face of disappointment and defeat. In steadfast hope, let us look beyond all partial achievement to the final triumph of God. And now unto God, who by the power within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think. To God be the glory in the church and Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.